Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Goodman with Art Matcher, the mobile app which will bring innovation to the art industry and is coming to you soon. While we work hard to build and release this app, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today. Welcome to the Art Matcher podcast. My name is Michael Goodman. I have a special guest, friend, uh, fellow LOX alumni, Los Angeles County High School for the Arts, Alex Kupchak. Hey, thanks, Michael. Did I say your last name correctly? You did. Oh, thank God. You know, it's funny. Uh, years ago, uh, do you know my friend Josh? Um, I think so. Josh Hashemzadeh? The name sounds very familiar. Well, it's interesting because early on when I was working with him, I didn't know how to say his last name and I completely butchered it on like this recording. So if you go to YouTube, you can find that. <laughs> Alex, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, I was born in California. Both my parents are animators and they worked for many of the movies that shaped my childhood, you know, like uh, Pocahontas, Hercules, that kind of stuff. Um, wow. I didn't know that. I mean, your dad and your mom worked. Yeah. They both worked on those films together. Wow. Wow. I'm like, I'm learning something about you every day. Yeah. Many, including many more. Um, and I thought I wanted to be the end animator like them for the longest time. Um, but it wasn't really until Loxa where I kind of realized where I wanted to be. I, I, and just for the audience, Loxa's that's a school, Los Angeles County high school for the arts. It's a very, uh, prestigious art school here on the West coast in California. Yeah. And it's like art half the day and then regular academics, the other half. So I had six, um, arts classes per week. And so I took uh, animation classes as well as painting classes and stuff like that. And, uh, I took 2d animation and I was like, yeah, you know, this isn't really for me. I'll took 3d animation. And then I was like, you know what, this is really not my thing. I'm not an animator. And I found that I was really the most happy and, like really enjoying myself in my painting classes. And you're native here to California. You said, where did you, where, where did you grow up? Um, Sunland, California. So. Sunland, California. Yes. Wow. I actually like, I know where that is, but I don't know. I've never been there. Funny enough being, I've also been in California for over 10 years now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just North of Burbank. There's not much going on. <laughs> yeah. That's like me. Is that near Simi Valley? Um, Simi Valley is kind of south and to the west. Um, he knows his geography better than I do. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the area. It's it's literally just north of Burbank. It's just no, over the north mountains. Of oh, wow. And some people, well, Burbank is where all the studios are and all the fun stuff. So, wow. So you grew up in Sunland. Where, when you were at Loxa, though, mm -hmm. were you commuting from there? Oh, yeah. Um, so I had a carpool of friends. So it was me, a jazz musician, a vocalist, and a classical um, uh, violist. And we would go all the way from Sunland to, you know. Did you guys take like, so just, I'm, I'm going to let people know. So our school, we had different disciplines. Um, we had visual arts, dancing, music. So it was a multi kind of art school. And so you commuted with these other students who were in different disciplines. Did you guys take like a train, a red line? Well, it's sometimes it was like a mix, right? So sometimes we would carpool all the way there. And then, um, other times, well, actually, I guess before I was with them, I had to do trains and stuff. And sometimes on the way back, I would do a lot of trains. It's not an easy commute from some. No, I, I it's, it's <laughs> amazing how like all these students, myself included, you have these students come from all over the place to go to this school. I used to have to take the Amtrak early on, like go to the, the, the station. And then it was until I discovered the red line. My parents, for some reason, were like so um, freaked out of the subway that I only started taking the subway like I think it was like sophomore or end of sophomore year because they yeah. were just like, oh, yeah, like. The subway is completely sketchy, but the train's completely fine. <laughs> Even though it's like, you know, you still have people riding the train for free. And, and, um, gosh, you know, when they would ticket, they're like, I'm not sure if you encountered when they would yeah. check for tickets. Yeah, yeah. It was so archaic back then, too. It was like a <laughs> hole punch. Now they have like, this is before, this is pre like tapping, tap cards. 
Oh my. Yeah. I mean, I remember. You don't really think about it, but (laughs) it's like, that's how old we are. Like we were still when they were punching things, like that's a thing, but it's, it's an amazing school. You have like, I think about how, how quickly you have to grow up to go to that school. I think it's only until after I graduated, I realized like the maturity level Oh my goodness. That we were at. Oh my goodness. So when um, you like go to community college, you're like, whoa. Yeah. Okay. So I went to Art Center um, College of Design recently. I just graduated in December. Congrats. Thank you. And um, as I was thinking about talking here today, um, my experience at Art Center, it's, 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 hold on. It's a rigorous, it's known as like one of the yeah. hardest programs. It's like, it's super breakback, and some people don't survive it. As an artist, you know, and a very hard school to get into. I mean, they normally accept students who are older for that matter. I hear like you don't find too many people uh, straight out of uh, senior year getting in there. That's true. Um, They used to the average age to enter used to be around 22, 23. But as time's gone on, they've started to lower and roll back the and adapt the age. But um, yeah, I think that still holds true. It works better if you enter later. But um, anyways, so as, as I was thinking about it, it really, my time at Art Center really kind of reminded me of my time at, at LOXA because I was doing the same things. There's all-nighters at LOXA. I was, I remember being in my bathroom drawing till 4 a.m. trying to just get my, get my weekly sketches done for this class. Yeah, that was like a regular <laughs> occurrence. I, I, I was the student in painting class. I would uh, show up to Barry Markowitz's class with a wet painting. And he just knew. He's like, you just worked on this before class. <laughs> and I would think I would be like, no, I didn't. Like, it's still, it was drying over last night. It's oil paint. That's why I always painted with oil. I was like, no, I'm not doing this acrylic stuff. Uh-huh. Um, and it's funny. I didn't take, uh, no, I took, uh, unfortunately, I did not take Loxa to, like, I, I, I think everyone says this about high school is like, they wish they would have, like, tried or done better if they were that student that didn't do well. But if I could do it all over again, it's like, wow. It's like, I'll tell you a funny story is when, uh, when graduating locks, I was going to uh, San Francisco art Institute. Nice. And it was me and Chris, we were in this class in this painting class. And like the teacher is trying to like stump the students, like wherever you came from, you don't know art. And like, Mm -hmm. they're, they're asking like these basic art history questions, like, you know, Whistler's mother and Chris and I are answering the questions like all correctly. Like, okay, you guys are funny. You guys are in the grad (laughs) program. Just, you know, antagonizing the freshmen. Like, no, we're freshmen. Like we learned this in high school and they're like, huh? And I was like, wow, that, that's what kind of showed me how high of an art uh, education we got there. I mean, we had some really good faculty. I mean, oh yeah. uh, Miss Rush for history. Oh, who, yeah. who is your favorite um, professor? Oh, I could never do that to them. Oh, you couldn't. You couldn't put them on blast. No, I couldn't. I could never put, pick a favorite. Or what was, was your favorite like class then, medium wise? I mean, that has nothing to do with the professor. It has to do with the. Um, well, you know what? Here's what I will say. Miss Rush is an angel, and we had the greatest time in her class. Um, she was. Well, she already got an A for that. So. I mean, she- <laughs> What was her last name? Just so the audience can know. Or do you remember it? I don't remember. Miss Rush? Yeah. Something with an L. Well, her last name's Rush. Her first name, I guess. Lori. 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 That's what it was. Lori Rush. Check her out wherever she is. Yeah. I mean, that was that was fantastic. Um, Barry Markowitz, is, he was the one who um, did a lot of drawing classes for me. And that was, that was really hardworking. And I really... Um, developed a lot in his classes, though I hated it at the time. And um, uh, David Shoffman as well was a really big inspiration of mine because... um, uh, First figurative. uh, Yeah, that was a figure drawing class, but that wasn't as important as um, the way he cultivated the art spirit in the young students. I think about this a lot. Like I feel like his class um, kind of really showed me how to be an artist and like the mindset to get into. He talked a lot about the artist's ego as well as, you know, just really, I mean, just adult art concepts. You know, he brought that to us really fast. Yeah, the conceptualizing of art and not only just looking at art uh, kind of aesthetically. 
Yeah, I mean, especially as a, as a kid, that's the easiest thing to, to understand is the aesthetic part. But um, I don't know, the artist ego was huge for me because he would he would say stuff like, you know what, if you get in first, you know, to the school, you can you can set up and you can like put your giant paper cover the wall, you know, you can take up more than one spot, you know, because you got there first, you were the one, you know, who has the ego and the effort and you did all this. So you, you get to cause a hassle for the class and claim your terror. It's so interesting because there are certain classes. I mean, would you say the, what, what has been more important, the formal aspect of the education or the, uh, like the conceptualizing meaning. And when I say formal is like honing your technique. Well, um, I definitely understand what you're saying. I think that the well, when we say conceptual, you're kind of talking about the thinking part of like how it works. But I think even more important than that is like the artist part. So I would categorize it in three ways. I would have the technical, the conceptual, and also the like the soul of the artist, you know? Okay. Um, so technical is obvious. Um, the conceptual is like the signs and significations of all the, you know, things. Would that you are say the conceptual... Would you also consider that a narrative if someone is more of a storyteller? Definitely. Okay. And then um, the artist's soul, and this is in terms of like the artist, right? The What makes up the talent, the yeah. body of the artist's mind. Um, but that soul, like the the drive, the like... The passion. The passion, the want to experiment and create and the ego, like I was talking about. Like, I think that was huge for me. Like the... like. A lot, it like allows you to create, you giving know, yourself permission, giving yourself permission. That was like exactly the words Ta- You know, it's interesting. Uh, and this brings back a memory. You had a show here called, I'll never forget. It was something strange pistachio. I think it's a- abstract flavor, semicolon pistachio. Yes. That's what it was. The semicolon. <laughs> and it's interesting. You had this huge painting. I'll never forget this. You mm-hmm. had this, I think it was like eight feet by 12 feet. That's right. And, exactly the size. And you had like this small, like hatchback of a car. And I was like, (laughs) how is this guy delivering this giant painting in this little car? And uh, it was amazing because you created these makeshift kind of panelings that then came together. Yeah. And I said, wow, like the back then in the early days of doing shows here at MRG, it was like, whoa, it was like, I mean, we, that was the, and then we stretched the canvas. We had to stretch the canvas in the gallery. Um, and it was amazing. I don't know how big that car was, but it was yeah. tiny. It was, it, was a, it was a tiny car. Um, <laughs> do you still have that car? No. Okay. No, he doesn't have the car, but it was a very small car. And he somehow, uh, managed to, to fit these giant, um, I think you even assembled some of the wood in here. Yeah, no, that, that happened. It wasn't the most elegant solution, but, um, I was just starting off. I was really in the infancy of my artistic ability and I really wanted to, um, go big. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to make a big canvas. I worked on it for, I think a year out of high school, something like that. Um, and then, uh, well, you know, on and off as it goes. And then, um, and then I realized, you know, in order to transport this thing, there's no way it's going to, I can stretch this. So I worked on it, um, just rock, well, well canvas and the gesso. And then um, uh, I did build these three panels that not only could be assembled and disassembled quickly, but um, had like brackets so yeah. that they could um, f- hold together strong. And then I could stretch it pretty easily just to get it the solution today i'm like rent a truck yeah i mean i'm now i'm now i'm uh no but it's it's interesting like you know those early times when you're just trying to you're already you've put in so much time and effort and hours and it's like you know a lot of it's saving dollars and Mm -hmm. and stuff like that and it's interesting as I think artists become more mature in that they become more methodical of like, Oh yeah, I I don't, I don't go big for that reason or something (laughs) like they just go like, yeah, you know, unless some person's paying me for a commission or there's a rhyme or reason, but it's interesting. Don't you find it interesting that like now that could be a, like, um, you're not like artists could be not encouraged to doing something, just knowing the logistics of like, Versus being fearless and just like, yeah, I'm just going to do this. I'm not really thinking about like, 
Because I th- when I see artists like Damien Hurst or yeah. these big artists and you see them going just crazy sizes. So cool. It, it's so cool. But then you go like, wow, they're really fortunate enough. Because like, where do you find a studio to house that? I mean, I couldn't even house those those paintings at my gallery. They're so big. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, you need to have this space to, to be able to work that large, yet alone store it. I mean, how many paintings do you have in storage? Oh my goodness. Um, there, it's, have, oh my goodness. It's not even a number. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I can't even think of the number. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a little, a lot of, I don't have a lot of space, but it's all, I, you know, is it all rolled up? No, I don't like to take them off the stretcher bar now. Now, okay, now, now, now it's more mature. It's like yo, now we're more these, mature. These ma- these masterworks need to keep their form. Better material. I'm all about lastability now. So, oh, I've- nice. The, that he's painting on linen, which lasts 800 years, guys. <laughs> 800. That that's what my artists have told me. I mean, I'm I'm quoting one of my artists who's been doing it for a while. But so, so now, now you have a, do you have like a separate storage unit or is it in your studio? Um, no, this is just in my, uh, my studio. Okay. He's like slash apartment. Or <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, guys. Yeah. Artists are allowed to, to, to live where, you know, they could, they could work where they live. Yeah. But to go back to your earlier point about, um, size and scale, um, I think that's still the ego thing, right? So I still give myself permission to work that big. So I did another nine <laughs> foot painting. Oh wow! Yeah, um, and that one actually can fit inside my roof, but I could I transported that um, to school when I needed to show it wow. with by hiring a a big truck, you know? Yeah. So um, no, it's it's interesting, and your experience like it's interesting. I didn't know you were at Art Center, but Art Center, I feel like you know, you really need the technical chops to like make it through their program. Cause they're, they're heavily focused on, on the technique. Well, like, well, I think so. Or you correct me if I'm wrong. Well, especially in the illustration program, right? Yeah. So the, uh, the fine art program is a little bit different, but in the illustration program, a little um, bit more lenient in the, in the fine art. Yeah. Um, in the <laughs> illustration program, you're definitely, you definitely have to have those chops and they cultivate that in you with like a year of technical skill. But I mean, to be honest with you, most of the people that succeed come in with a certain level and they develop quickly and get really good. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I think of every time when I think about who is the best illustrator, uh, you know, Reed actually went to Art Center as well. I know Reed. I saw him when he was there. Yeah. Okay. So, dude, that guy, it took him like 10 times to get in, I think. I'm going to have him on the podcast and ask him to oh, confirm. But, excellent. <laughs> but uh, not to throw Reed under the bus, but it's interesting because, you know, he really wanted to go there. Yeah. For a good reason. It was a yeah. great school. And he was, he was, he was doing well and happy when I was there. And yeah. He, I mean, he was just graduating when I found him. Cause so I didn't go to art center directly out of school. It took, you went to Santa Monica community college, right? I went to Santa Monica community college just to get some GEDs for a little bit. And then I also went to, um, the school of the museum of fine arts in Boston to take a fine art degree program. That was my initial first choice. Um, I, I kind of chose it for money a little bit because I did get into a couple other schools like RISD and SFAI, but then I chose kind of based on money and, yeah, SFAI, they probably didn't give you a good financial aid package. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because I had to pay my debts. <laughs> well, they actually, yeah, well, they gave me a competitive one, so I actually used it to um, to talk down the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. That is so funny. Yeah, um, but anyways, uh, so I went, I went there, but it was a fine art program, and it turned out not to be a great fit, so I did end up leaving, and then I um, worked you know, trying to make the fine art thing happen for myself for maybe a couple of years. And then I, um, and then I started at art center when I really, really. Wow. So, I mean, so what was the break there? Because it's interesting. Most people that I know in the arts is when they leave art school, they leave, they don't go back. So yeah. coming back, how was that like going back into the school, uh, kind of rubric? Cause I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Like this is my view on sometimes on art school. It's mm-hmm. like somewhat kind of bullshit, if you will, because like, <laughs> no, because like they're not teaching you the, like you still have to practice and do your art. Of course. You know, they're, they're not teaching business classes or any of that in preparation to the real world. Mm-hmm. So the most important way to learn about art is 
by making art, trying yeah. things, doing things, experimenting. Um, I think Loxa going back to our high school was so good at giving, uh, kind of the, the students, the preparation, uh, at least technically, like I learned a lot of technical skills. Yeah. Like I learned about grids. I learned about different techniques and mm-hmm. painting. I took classes that I didn't really want to take like animation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I took drawing, you know, certain stuff. Um, I took ceramics, you know, I never, I would have never been interested in ceramics if we didn't. And like, look how, how fortunate we were to even have a ceramics. Like we had, like, I know my goodness. Like, you know, I look, I, some, some of the colleges are like, wait, you had ceramics. We don't even have like the facility for that. And then, uh, funny enough at Santa Monica, I, I attended there for a little bit. I took glass blowing. Oh, that's super cool. I, I saw the class. I, I wanted it. D- they would fight tooth and nail for that class. It was <laughs> it was a mishap for me. So there's this like super desirable class called glass blowing at Santa Monica Community College. I it was an elective. I I guess chose that I didn't really know what I was choosing. I just like needed to pick something, and I didn't like the first day of class. Luckily, I came on time because if you don't come on time, they just <laughs> they just drop you. And they had like thirty people waiting to see if people are going to get dropped. Oh my God. And I was like, 30 people are like, literally there's a line to wait to see if someone didn't come. Uh, I came on time and I was like, Oh cool. You know? So that was a really cool medium to experience with, uh, for myself as oh, yeah. a creative. But I want to talk about kind of what is, what is it like in the life of an artist? And you would know better than me now, since you're fresh out of it, like coming out of school, coming into the real world, having you already gone through the real world and back. So can you like, tell me about these experiences you've been having or the experience, I mean, during this pandemic as well? Sure. Um, What is is it like in the, the, the days of an artist, a real artist? (laughs) It's a compliment. Thank you. Um, well, there was a struggle to get back into school after coming out, right? So I, I was a little headstrong, to be honest, when I first came in. Because I was like, you know what? I was, you know, I, I had this. You know, I was like, I, I was working in the real world. I like, I, I know what an artist is, you know. Yeah. But, you know, um, so I was a little bit resistant to some of my teachers at first. But, um, you know, you kind of... it. I think it took the first two semesters, like the first semester I was like, you know, I'm, oh, fundamentals, like I can do fundamentals, you know, yeah, like, I'm already doing it. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then, um, and then it just, and then it kind of like, I don't know, I guess I just softened up or something. And I was like, you know what, this is really good for me. Like I need this, you know, I mean, learning is always good. I, I just, even though I have the skills, you know, just got to go farther. Well, what did you learn then? What did, what was new? What was refreshing about, uh, going back to school? You would be so surprised how much I learned there. Um, I have a teacher who's now a good friend of mine who always says that art center saved him. And, um, I feel a similar way. It's, it was fantastic. Um, I learned new mediums. Like, so in art, in, in Loxa experimenting is everything. So sometimes, having that kind of technical training at that age is too, is too much. And it's more about like finding yourself, you know what I'm saying? So like not everyone who goes to Loxa ends up being an artist. Most that, actually don't. Yeah. But just having the experience of trying all these new things is like the most valuable part, you know, yeah. being able to take the animation, the ceramics class, like that's, that's super cool, you know, and that's like, even if I wasn't an artist, I would be like, yeah, that's totally worth it, you know, but I ended up loving this and discovering it came kind of a similar way. I thought I was going to be an animator, but I discovered that painting is my thing. So, um, again, that was, that was super important. Um, so then going, going back into art center, uh, having the technical training, like I said, well, it's interesting. So you, you, you went to Loxa, graduated, then you went to Boston. That's right. And then you took a break, you were in the art world. And then how many years later did you then go to Art Center after that? Um, so it took so I was there for like three ish years. You can kind of take summers too. So I went 
pretty, I went almost straight through. I took a couple of breaks because um, I just wanted some time to get my portfolio. But um, actually what I was saying earlier about what I was learning is um, mediums, like I said. So that was an important one, like watercolor. I never thought I would like watercolor. Watercolor is so hard. It oh, is, yeah. It is unforgiving. And um, and I thought this was not for me. And then I took a couple classes with the legendary Jeff Smith. Oh, my goodness. You know, I just I learned so much. And um, I really fell in love with it. I just couldn't believe it. And now watercolor is like my second medium behind oil. Wow. And um, it actually offers me a good respite from oil because um, I actually developed an oil allergy too, which is kind of an issue. Wow, really? Yeah. um, It's called a sensitivity to oil paint. I didn't know what was going on for the longest time. I mean, I didn't have the best painting practices. You know, sleep in the room with no good ventilation with turp, you know, and stuff like that and horrible ventilation, you know, especially when it was like cold, you know, and I would just be like, no, screw it. I'm not because you think you're going to be, you know, the crazy thing is I know that feeling where you're just like, you know, you hear about it, but because you physically can't see it, you're just like. You could smell it, but you're just like, ah, you know, get used to it. (laughs) Well, you know, I knew it was taking years off my life, but I was like, you know what? I mean, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Burn twice as bright for half as long. So that's, (laughs) so that was my, that was my plan. But, um, I don't know. So I kept painting and painting and I was getting to art center and I was doing oil paintings and I was just feeling terrible. And it was really crazy because I was like, what's even going on? So, um, I started doing some snooping. I like. I had an art materials class, which yeah. talked about the safety of art materials, which is, I feel like sometimes even undertaught at the college level, you know, like you take an oil painting class, they don't tell you, um, the exact specifics of all this stuff. You know, they say, you know, I know certain, certain oils are more toxic than one another too, like certain pigments. Oh yeah. I, I know about that now. <laughs> yeah. Now you're like, yo, you're talking to a professional, uh, <laughs> that <yeah>. yellow ochre, <laughs> that burnt sienna. No. <laughs> I still know a couple of my colors. No, that, that's very interesting. You know, I think it's interesting for me coming from the distributing side of things, uh, running an art gallery, managing talents and stuff, um, and having a background in the production of the things it's, it's crazy how much an artist in today's world has to juggle, uh, aside from also creating the product, creating the, the work. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, you, you got to wear multiple hats. You're trying to get, find a representative. You're trying to find, you know, someone who could work with you. And then it's crazy. You know, you talk about watercolors and I have like artists come to me like, oh, should I be doing like drawings or should I not be doing drawings or watercolors because they don't, they don't fetch as much money. Yeah. So you don't even use the medium because you're like, oh, it's perceived as less. And that's kind of so sad because- The romantic kind of relationship people should have with um, art, I think, is like the relationship an artist has with the medium, meaning you're using watercolor because it can give you it can you can portray that type of feel with it. It's not going to do what oil's doing. It's not going to do what acrylic's doing and the way the paint moves, the fluidity of it. And it's so funny. Some of these conversations, a the conversation I'm having with you right now, some, some people will look at that conversation and they'll be like, oh, that's very shishi. You know, it's like, oh, that's highfalutin art. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a, there's a beautiful balance. Like in that highfalutin aspect of art, I see it like poetry. I'm not sure. Do you see it the same way? I mean, maybe, maybe I got too lost into art school, but that, that's the way I see it. No, I mean, I, I feel a similar way. I think that you should be... I feel like an artist should be making in whatever medium they want to be, you know, making in. They shouldn't really be considering the um, the financial aspect, except to the point where um, money is freedom of the brain, you know, so that yeah. you can do what you want. And that's that's for me. That's what it is. How how do you as an artist determine your value? Ooh. Um, uh, I guess, you know, we have to go to the yogis and self-worth comes from within. Um, at some at some level, the the artist ego um, happens for me in that, you know, in that regard, like I, I give myself the value more than I know that I actually have. You know, I think I'm better than I am so that I can keep going. Um, I have a certain amount of pride in what I do generally, you know, but I you know, got to give yourself a little extra to give yourself the permission and stuff. Um, 
But financially, how do you think about it? And so it's interesting because I had an artist here uh, on another podcast and I broke down some numbers to him uh, on some paintings. So when you create a painting, when you're done with the painting, mm-hmm. do you then ask like a gallerist, do you ask someone else what the value is or do you have a number in mind after you've created it Well, in some shape or capacity? Uh-huh. I'd be curious your answer because I've heard an answer from another artist and it was interesting how he answered. So, well, mine's a very logical explanation. I know I'm a starting out. I know I'm a, I'm in, you know, I'm starting my career, you know, officially after coming out of art center. So I know my prices are based on that. So I take like, you know, a starting artist's number and that's kind of what i assign it i I go based on size and do you go based off like you look in like what other artists that have similar aesthetic and say okay this guy is getting this much so i'm gonna price it like that a little bit but also no because um there are artists who i think are you know way better than me and and i'm not gonna like well there's artists who are making more money than me that I think maybe, you know, don't deserve to be making that much money, but I'm not going to price my stuff higher than them because of, you know, how the art market works and the establishment and stuff. So I have to price lower. I have to price at the starting artist salary, regardless of how good I think my work is or how good it actually is in reality. <laughs> that No, it, it's amazing because like, look, this is what I do for a living, yeah. you know? And it's like, I have to determine values and people ask me the question, like, how did you come to that value? Yeah. And it's amazing because one of my, uh, dear artists, he had passed away. His name was Coleman Aaron. He was like 94 years old. Mm-hmm. And this is a saying by Picasso or some famous artist, but he reiterated it to me. And, and, uh, there was a collector that I had brought in and, he was looking, most of the paintings were in uh, 30, 40, 50,000 range. And there was a drawing. He said, he was looking, how much is that drawing? And uh, he was like, $10,000. And the collector was like, $10,000? Like, why is that $10,000? Like, that's crazy. He's like, how long did it take you? And he answered and he said, My uh, it life. took me 94 years. Yep. And... He said, no, it didn't. And he said, no, it took me 94 years to do it in five minutes so effortlessly. Yeah. And you think about that and it's like, okay, the guy is older, so his value is more. But it's interesting that you say your starting point as a starting artist, because I don't see you as a starting artist. You've been doing art since Loxa, since those days. That's what now, what, I don't know how many years, but, True. you know, it's very fascinating because the last guy who I asked, his name's Bergen, shout out to Bergen. He said, I have an expensive living and to maintain my expensive living, that's how I change. That's how I charge towards my, like I, I, I'm entitled to live a decent life and he doesn't live an extravagant life. He was like, I drive a Toyota Corolla. Like I'm not like, you know, bougie out here, but who says like, you're not deserving of like nice things or want nice things. You know, you should want to have those nice things or whatever you value. Agreed. And it's interesting. Uh, we were talking about numbers and I was like, and I'm going to ask you the same question. How many masterworks do you make a year? Masterworks? Like works that you're like, you're really proud in your eyes. Like they're ma- I call them masterworks. Cause like, you know, a, polished well works you could say now look i understand no artist is ever proud of their work but i would disagree it's always the recent one i'm always in love with it okay the recent one but how many of them are created a year oh um see that depends too approximately well paintings take time but i can turn out watercolors quickly i'm gonna um i'm not the fastest but i'd say i could I could turn 100, maybe 150 comfortably. A year? Yeah. I know people that can turn like 300, but like, I mean, watercolor is quick and I can't. Well, no, I'm not talking about little. I'm talking about like. You're talking about oil oil paintings. I'm talking about paintings that you're like, this is what I'm going to be remembered when I die. Oh my goodness. Like okay. they're going to study this stuff. Masterworks. Because oh, okay. I'm not talking about like. Small watercolors. Yeah. I know there was an artist we went to school with, Lachlan. He probably turned out five thousand in his Loxa career. Maybe, maybe he'll he'll be on the podcast too. I don't know. Um, oil paintings, paintings that you know. Okay, okay, okay. Um, maybe t- 
20. If I, that's, that's, that's being generous too. Being generous. Okay. So let's say it is 20. Yeah. 20 works and you sold, you, what, what do you think, what, what, what is the last sale for a painting? Like my final one when I'm dead? No, no, no. The, uh, the last, the last price you got on an oil pay uh, on an oil painting. Oh, um, like 2000, like 2000, right? You sell all 20, right? You sell all 20 of them. Yeah. That's 40 grand. Oh yeah. Big bucks. <laughs> no, but it, <laughs> no, it, I know that's not very much. No, but is that like a living wage? Not really. Not here in California. No, it's not. No. So that that's the interesting thing to me about like pricing art. You know, I have a fiduciary responsibility as a, as a gallerist, as a distributor to make sure like the deal is, we, we all want a deal that is worth it for everyone. And a lot of times we don't think about like, you know, the, the expense, the time you're not getting paid for oil to sit and dry, go back in at midnight and work on that layer. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's very fascinating. And I encourage all artists to like really think about, and I liked Bergen's answer, like, the type of quality of life you want to live and charge according to that. That's Cause a, you're not, you're not telling a CEO of a big company like, Hey, you know, you can't have that yacht. He's like, no, I'm That's coming in my bonus. <laughs> like, that's going, that's going to happen. So it's, it's very fascinating uh, to hear your take on that. And, and hopefully you'll, you'll give yourself more value in that sense. But uh, no, I, th I think, you know, the amazing part about it is I think, um, it's very, you're very conscious by like, I feel like part of who you are because I have like kind of the insight of knowing you longer. Like, yeah. I feel you do want people to have accessibility to your work as well. That's true. You yeah. Know, that, that's, like, that's an important part. Um, that's like such a compliment when someone's like, they have your work, they buy your work. Yeah. I think that's really sweet. Um, but at the same time, I know that like, the gal, you know, the way the the way that value works is based on reputation and renown, and I don't have that yet. Well, so. it's interesting. I uh, I learned something early on in the business where someone said perception is deception. And I was like, Yeah, that's Phew. one too. Like the perception of something. Um, I was just talking um, to a buddy of mine the other night, and it's it's amazing because here in LA, you know, you see a lot of nice things and stuff, and you really don't know the narrative behind people. It's and true. Like you just you you just never know. Like you could see a guy in a really fancy car. I know this from running a nightclub, and you think he's like has a lot of money, he doesn't have anything. <laughs> and I saw that yeah. plenty of times yeah. in the night world. Meaning they'll get a rental, they'll get a lease, whatever they can to kind of look it, be perceived as it. But, you know, in reality, they don't have it. So what have you been working on? What's the recent body of work uh, you've been working on looking at during this pandemic? What what are the subject matters? Let's try and uh, paint the picture, if you will. All right. All right. Um, so we'll, we'll be able to share his link and stuff and you'll be able to look at it on his website. Thank you. Towards the end. But let's let's try and paint it uh, with our words. Right. So, um, well, I had a couple... I, I work kind of between series. So sometimes I kind of have some, I have a bunch of different ideas and I kind of, I, I'm going to say strings of work, different modes of working that I like to work in. So sometimes it's full abstraction and sometimes it's like semi abstract, you know, figurative. And then sometimes I just like full figurative. So, um, but one of those strings for me lately has, um, has kind of been about death and oblivion and identity. And that one's kind of a big one for me. So that's, that's kind of followed me throughout my life, just in my internal dialogue. And, um, I wanted to bring that to the canvas because I never, I hadn't in my 24 years of living. Well, I'm 25 now, but, um, that's when I started doing these paintings. And, um, I was trying to convey the dread a little bit, like the existential dread, like the fear of death, the oblivion, the sense of loss of identity. That's like the big one, the loss of identity. The loss of identity. Okay. In death. And, um, so I tried to make these like holes in the canvas, um, visually that could kind of represent for us, you know, when you're looking at it, like a visual discomfort that is sort of 
you know, it'll get you into the, the, the headspace of like something is kind of going wrong here. Like the composition is, is kind of skewed wonky, you know, like there's things, there's like things happening here. That's not making me comfortable, you know? Um, and that with the subject matter and, um, the painting style, the techniques, the color choices, all that have start have, um, tried to add up to these concepts and I've just kind of been like working through it. So, um, do you work on a, uh, pieces individually initially, or do you think of your body of work as a series? I, I tend to just keep going individually, but I have worked in series before. So, um, cause for me, I, I know going into, if I'm tackling a body of work, I yeah. know it's going to be in a series, meaning it's almost like, I know I'm going to say too much and that's why I need to con- like, I'm going to need like, this is going to be, have to disperse because, and I think we've all done this as artists where you just overwork a painting. Oh yeah, totally. Like, you know, there'll be this thing and you'll see like this brilliant moment in the painting. It will be like, I need to achieve that all over, but then it's not the painting. If it's all over, you need Truth. that brilliant moment, like one or twice, one time mm-hmm. it's that weird kind of, is this painting at the level we want to see it? And that's why I've gravitated personally thinking of works in, in series in that sense. Like, yeah, I'm doing a series. I'm trying to talk about something or I guess back then they would call them periods. Like Picasso (laughs) had his blue period, yeah, his cubism and stuff like that. It's very interesting. So you go at it primarily as you tackle the work individually though. This this is going to sound really romantic. I do it in kind of how I feel it. You know, like what, <laughs> what ideas are resonating within my, in that moment, in my body going into it. So I'll be like, you know what? I've been thinking a lot about like death and identity. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna think I'm going to go with that. I have and channel that. Uh, yeah. I have some, I'll start some sketches and then I'll work, you know. Okay. That's really interesting. The process. So do you initially do a preliminary like type of sketch drawing before you tackle what I like to call a masterwork? Well, Art centers really taught me to get into a process. Um, so, and I've just, I've kept it. So it's, it is preliminary sketches, you know, and then we'll work into like finished sketches, you know, and these, I'm talking about drawings that are like fully fleshed out. And has that helped in terms, cause like, you know, there's all these rules when you're, when you're taught some formality in art, like, you know, don't work from a white canvas, prime <laughs> the thing, you know, like. And it's amazing because I have some artists who've been doing it a while. Like mm-hmm. one of my star artists, Robert Tannenbaum, like he works from like a white canvas. He don't care. Like, yeah. Like, and I'm like, wow. Like, but you know, I know working from like a gray canvas is just easier. Yeah. <laughs> it is easier, you know, to when the can. So do you, do you like follow those processes? Well, here, let me tell you what's, what's going on. So right, with the, with, down. with, with a, with a actual painting that I'm doing, I tend to, I tend to do the sketches, do the finished sketch, and then I'll start to work. I'll transfer the sketch to a canvas, um, either via grid, via grid, which I tend to do, or um, or I can just project it on because I have a projector. Projector, um, yeah. Especially if I do a really, you don't do the old school transfers with the with the with the graphite too messy. <laughs> no, that's that's rough. I learned that from Dahlberg's class. Oh, no yeah. joke. <laughs> yeah, I, did you I, have him? Justin Dahlberg? Um, I think I did, but I, 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 I don't know. I can't really remember. He was a tough guy, tough professor. I mean, I, I, I know from the gift of love, I submitted, this was a book we uh, got to submit our work Oh, that's to. right. I remember that. I would, I submitted his work cause I knew it was like the best work I created. <laughs> I was like, yo, if, if there was someone who pushed me, uh, in my, arti- in my artistic endeavors, it was him. Um, so it's interesting. So you, you do, you take a very formal then process by doing all that. Well, then I, then I paint over it with acrylic so I can seal the drawing. And just in case, if I want to wipe off the oil, I can go back to the drawing oh, anytime. Interesting. And then I put the like oil Like a clear down. coat? I, I just do a really wash. White gesso? No, no, no. Just a wash of acrylic. So I'll actually paint it in acrylic, but, but really washy, right? So wait, wait, wait. You paint the, like, do you go, does graphite hit the canvas? Yeah. So I, I have the, I have the, I build my own canvases now, by the way. So I, I stretch the, the, the linen, <laughs> linen, yes. and then I, um, and then I will gesso it myself and then, um, I will draw directly on the canvas with the graphite 
and then I'll put the uh, the wash of acrylic on, which again seals the drawing, and I'm using the colors. So that wash, is that wash? Because when I think about gesso, most people think of white. I know they have clear gesso. Is it yeah. a clear-based gesso, or is it just a very faint white wash gesso? So my, my white gesso, right after I stretch the canvas, is opaque and white. And then when I'm doing the acrylic wash, it's not gesso. It's just acrylic paint that I'm washing on. Oh, okay, it's acrylic paint, so it seals it in there. Yeah, and I'm using the colors that I would paint over. So it's it's not a white canvas when I'm working this way. Got it. When I'm working from a model, like a live model, live painting, um, I'll work on a white canvas if I'm going out and uh, landscape painting. Same thing, just straight to white. Wow. I'm, I'm used to it. It doesn't bother me too much. I don't know. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing, I think, why... Uh it was so helpful. And this is for the listeners to like not work from a white canvas is because when you're working with a white canvas and there's going to be a lot of color, uh, the way it was explained to me is you wouldn't want that white to seep through. And it's very easy for like, it's hard to put enough paint on a canvas where you're actually covering the canvas. Yeah. So by like covering at a certain tone, that white, you can eliminate that aspect versus like a gray or something else would hide. But if you're working from a black, some people work from like dark to light. That's another reason sure. uh, to do it. I found that very challenging unless you're working with charcoal. Uh, um, I work dark to light. Oh, you do? Yeah. With my paintings, I do it. Interesting. Do you find that the whites pop more when you do that? Um, We're getting no, real it's technical just, right no, now. <laughs> no, that's just how I got taught to paint. Um, uh, one of the big inspiration, well, one of the big teachers for me was Sean Cheatham. And he, okay. and, um, he works like that. Um, I, I adopted his palette for the most part. I've made a couple of changes since then, and I'm sure I will as I keep painting, but, um, yeah, it's, he works dark to light. His whole painting style is to get it right the first time, you know, um, which never, ha- almost never happens. You'd be surprised. Um, but with him, he gets it right. He's, all of- he's very good. And, um, but his, but again, so it's getting it right. It's blocking out color shapes. So it's about shape design a lot with this painting. Um, steps where you work in steps, then you can blend it out and then make touch ups, you know, after. And so that's the way I work too. Very cool. Well, we're out of time, which we're going to have to have a second uh, part with Alex Kupchak. Uh, that way you aren't, you'll have to tune into the second episode of Alex. Can you give the audience, where can we find the the amazing work we're talking about? What's your website? He has a new awesome website. Thank you. Um, It's alexkupczyk.com. So that's spelled K-U-P-C-Z-Y-K because it's a Polish name, you know. Spell it one more time because that's, it's a tough name to to spell. (laughs) Yeah. Alex K-U-P-C-Z-Y-K. Very cool. Well, I'm looking for it. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, Please uh, indulge in our next episode. We'll probably have Alex on again. We will. So you guys could hear more about his work and see it and enjoy it. Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode. And like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.